The Process, a podcast about creativity and experimental music. In the world of experimental music, outcomes and accolades for creators can be uncertain and at times seem far and few between. Therefore, creators and practitioners of experimental music must embrace the one thing they will always have complete control over, the process. This podcast aims to understand this creative process by listening to new works and discussing them with their creators. Each episode focuses on one creator and their music. Understanding how and why they create can inform aspiring creatives and help audiences better understand and navigate experimental music. I'm Dr. Doug Bielmeyer, and I'll be your host as we explore the world of experimental music, creativity, and the human need to find purpose in their world and lives. This is The Process. All right, uh, welcome to the podcast. Merry Christmas for those who uh, celebrate it. Um, Otherwise, uh, happy holidays and happy new year. This will be our uh, last episode of 2021. And uh, the next episodes will start in uh, late January uh, as the rest of part of season three. Um, so yeah, happy holidays to everyone. Hope you've had a great year. Hope, um, 2022 is great for you. And, uh, let's hope that the world doesn't come to an end in the interim. On today's episode, I had the great opportunity to talk to James Ilgen Fritz, Brian Chase, and Robbie Lee of a new project called Loss and Gain on the Infrequent Seams record label. The project is fantastic. It's experimental jazz. It's just experimental. Um, it's drony sometimes. It's ambient sometimes. Uh, very interesting. Uh, today we'll listen to a bit of Fragile. Uh, we got talking on this episode about the creative lifestyle, and I used one of the classic uh, creative cogitations 2.3 is a creator's lifestyle linked to a stable existence. And I guess my idea, my thought was I was focusing on these sort of tropes about how, you know, the the starving artist or the struggling artist or or even the tormented uh, artist. And the group was very op- optimistic about the whole creative process. And um, you'll hear uh, both Brian and James have sort of a, well, that's life and this is meant to happen. And if you... If it doesn't work out, try something else. Um, And, you know, uh, both of them, including Robbie, have been very successful uh, in careers in New York and um, in the experimental uh, scene uh, and music industry. Um, So it doesn't come any surprise that their their response would be if if it doesn't work at first, try try something else. Um, But I think something Robbie said that you'll hear towards the end of the podcast talked about how we envision what the creative process is or or the common misconception about what creating is. And he said something very interesting. He said that we often look at being creative as a means for the creator to express themselves. And instead, he looks at it quite differently. He looks at the creative process as a way to create ourselves or create our identity. I think that's very interesting. I think that's very exciting. But I kind of question, does that really mean anything? Is that just creative speak? Okay, so if if I'm being creative and I'm creating my identity, if I cease to create, am I no longer creating my identity? Do I Do I not then have an identity? I don't know. Maybe that's not important. Maybe that's taking something that was a message that was actually really positive. Uh, and uh, sort of nitpicking at it. But I wonder then, does that put a lot of pressure on as I'm trying to create or as I'm in the creative process that this is an act of me creating myself? Um, And so then am I not being honest with myself if I'm not creating the things that are me? Or 
does it get so meta as what I create ends up being me? Uh, I feel like I'm in a, like a really bad science fiction movie about uh, uh, changing or altering the future. I guess I didn't like that answer, and and I still can't figure out if it was one of the most genius things I've I've heard about the creative process in a while, or if I'm missing something. Either way, I think you're going to find this episode fascinating and hearing James, Brian, and Robbie talk about their music uh, and their current project, as well as just some of their great ideas and concepts for creating not only experimental music, but just music creation and communication in general. So let's start things off here by listening to a little bit of uh, Fragile, just the uh, first part of it. Um, and then learn a little bit more about James, Brian, Robbie, and their loss and gain release on the label Infrequent Seams. The improvising trio of bassist James Ilgenfritz, drummer Brian Chase, and esoteric woodwind specialist Robbie Lee was founded with the common bond of shared musical ideas. Lee describes the group as somewhat like a collective brain where there's a biofeedback organism vibe. That collective brain includes a blend of lowercase abstraction, contemplative jazz musings, and contemporary classical chamber music that embraces artistic expressions that value vulnerability, fragility, and subtlety. Their most recent release, Loss and Gain, a 40-minute set of diverse, meditative, and even quietly expressive improvised performances, was released on the Infrequent Seams record label. On today's episode, we listen to excerpts from the track Fragile, So let's begin with the creative process. Where for you as a group does does and did uh, the creative process begin for a project like Lost Gain? Robbie, why don't we why don't we start with you and can kind of go around the horn? It's a largely improvised music group, um, and so I think the creative process um, really is more individual and. This is not a group where we get together and have a band meeting and discuss a plan. We, there were a few plans made for the recording session about um, after playing together for a while, when you're going to go into the studio on a limited time, how do you get the most out of that experience? And that might be the most deliberate that we have ever been as a group. I would say, though, for the large part, the creative process of this group, it's such a such a close listening playing environment that the creative process is almost this this micro microscopic microcosm that's that's invented uh in the act of playing itself uh, that's sort of abstract but it it feels correct it, it yeah it's it's not a pre-planned environment 
Um, but it's also not free improv, anything goes. Uh, it's more like collectively trying to find a space together with the piece that you're able to bring. Uh, it's very hard to talk about that in a non, not completely abstract way. Does that mean anything? Yeah, you know, so James, like it, I'm assuming then, you know, kind of what Robbie's saying and, and kind of listening to the album, that there were there wasn't written parts. There was there wasn't like you weren't handed sheet music and you, you weren't like a session musician and you didn't show up to the gig with uh, sheet music and a chart to 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 follow. Uh, so Brian wrote, brought brought in a a, a a chart, so to speak. He'll talk more about oh, it. Later. Great. But um, and that was also with a new, a different tuning that that brought these um, mm -hmm. harmonics and things. And so, uh, the that would be sort of like something that we brought to the recording session in particular, plus some strategies about um, how we, what types of pieces we wanted to record. We'd done only a couple of gigs together before that. And um, I think, I mean, one thing I, I, I think is really important is to say is that the recording session itself really defined our long-term working dynamic, I think, because all the gigs we've, di we've done since then, I think really like there's a real difference between the gig, the couple of gigs we did before the recording session and then what we did at the recording session and, and what the gigs that came after that were like. And I think that the gigs that came after that, so, so the recording you notice has a lot of shorter tracks. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and when we play, usually we play longer pieces. Um, I don't actually recall too much how that worked with our, those first couple gigs, but the next gig we did after the recording session, uh, we did long pieces, but the listening and the, shared language and uh, sort of sonic empathy uh, was on a level, on a completely different level from the gigs we did before the recording session. Mm -hmm. And I think that that process of recording and sort of identifying, I want, we're gonna look at, we're gonna do a piece that looks at this aspect of what we do and this aspect of what we do. That's sort of how we approach the recording session. The result was that when we would get together and play, our, our languages already were really, calibrated so we were always you know sort of speaking a shared language at that point because we understood the translations and so forth and so the pieces were generally much longer but they were also overall on this very close listening level and i, I really feel like it was the recording session itself that really mm -hmm. took it to that level so brian there there i was wrong there were charts so were these like lead sheets, like from a traditional jazz kind of lead sheet thing? What, were there Nashville numbers involved? There were only uh, two charts, and then one of them ended up on the recording. And uh, that particular piece, which is called Happening, is mm -hmm. uh, a piece that's, um, that has a bass part that's in just intonation, and then Robbie and I improvise on top of it. Mm -hmm. So that was, the, you know, that was the outline for the piece. Mm -hmm. So... And anybody can answer this one then. Um, so when did you first meet or how did, like, what are the rehearsals? Because you, you said you've had some, you performed some, um, perhaps you rehearsed some, then you went into the studio and then there's been sort of life after that. So where was really the beginning point? Was it just a, a jam session? Was it a rehearsal where you're looking at these charts? When did that initial sort of, creative process begin? I don't remember if we ever had a rehearsal. I, I would almost say that the rehearsals that we did mm -hmm. for this trio were not as this trio. The rehearsals were getting to know each other musically before right. this trio ever started. And then when the trio started, we may have gotten together once to sort of test out some sounds, but pretty much we played live and, um, and we invented this, the group in in performance in a way the performances were sort of the 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 impetus or the or the beginning of this creative process one thing i'll add with the creative process is that um is that i think it's important to note what uh robbie's describing as um your like you know a shared friendship and a shared musical relationship and then within that um there's uh 
the common particular interests. I think what was said as um, like the, the microscopic microcosm <laughs> of sound. <laughs> and then also what, what uh, James said, uh, like the, um, uh, sonic empathy. Uh, yeah. So it's like, I think you can describe us as like, you know, we're, we're, like, we're like buddies, you know, like we're, we're friends. Right. And like we, we have like active musical lives uh, together and then within the community. And then on top of that, like our, our very specific interests uh, overlap in a strong way. And I, I think that like overlapping is a real uh, like, you know, fuel to the fire for you know, yeah. the music that we make. The beginning of Fragile and specifically, you know, Brian, maybe you want to talk a little bit about this. At the start of Fragile, I heard what sounded like stick noise uh, in the drums. And uh, I was like, oh, did they like leave in some stick noise or whatever? Like, was it just like, wh wh what was that? And then, uh, which was really exciting, that grew into the, the percussion part, which was sort of... Um, this stick type sound. I, I don't, you can tell us exactly how you, how you created that sound, but I noticed that it, it, it felt like it was moving left and right. So I didn't know if that was just you positioning underneath the overhead microphones or between a spaced pair, but I felt that back and forth motion, uh, throughout fragile. Um, and so I didn't know if that was something that was just, you know, a, a live thing based on the miking, or if that would had been something that was done after the fact. Um, yeah, that was uh, me standing underneath the overheads and moving. Great. Just, just going know, back and forth. Yeah. 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 But you have to have a concept of what it might sound like. Absolutely. After the fact, to do that, right? Because you're not, I mean, you may have had headphones, but you're not listening to a, a mix. Oh, yeah. You know? I mean, that's almost like a, like, a, like a great pop singer who knows how to work a microphone for the effect that it's going to have. Absolutely. You have to have had some experience to be able to know that that's going to be an interesting choice to make in that moment. Yeah, you know, and I think the the you know the the score to tour or the tuning that that perhaps was going on in that piece, um, definitely the bow pressuring and then also the the multiphonics, uh, I believe that are happening because we have this left and right idea. The the drums really sort of kind of confirm that and. It makes it that much more exciting to know that, Brian, that's something you did as part of the performance and kind of listening um, to the way the piece ebbs and flows. Yeah, that that percussion part is just a bunch of sticks being kind of like fumbled mm -hmm. together. <laughs> yeah, it's, like, yeah. it's very incidental within itself, Yeah, uh, which is part of the appeal. And then, you know, with working with the mics, you know, it kind of changes the uh, perception of uh, foreground and background. Yeah. And also, uh, so there's that feeling of, of, uh, of distance as, as a quality, and then also spatially with left and right. Yeah. Um, so it's sort of like this sound could be like anywhere, you know, nowhere, you know, just kind of floating around <laughs> yeah. a little bit.
I, I think in general in life that stability is a myth that we uh, provide for ourselves and do, we project, certainly on social media, we project out to others. Sure. I'm fine. You're fine. Everything's doing great. Yeah. yeah. Doing great. I'm successful. Yeah. But the, the truth is that um, on some level, a projection of an, an ideal of a concept, uh, when we play, we're, 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 we, when we, when we play together, we're, we're engaging in a nonverbal, uh, communication Absolutely. and the things we're not saying are communicated in what we're playing. So we have a, a deeper conversation sometimes by playing together. And the conversation that does happen inevitably before and after uh, is sort of the light stuff. And when we get mm -hmm. to the playing, uh, there's a fullness and, and emptiness at the same time because we're not, because language is not, uh, our actual s s spoken language is not getting in the way. So there's an emptiness there that it, uh, clears up space, but there's a, a fullness to it because we're communicating things that we don't really manage to communicate, even if we want to, when we when we're are trying to to discuss things. So, to me, the the playing itself is a more stable uh, realization of who we are as as, as people and. Uh, so this stability is in the creative act and everything around it is sort of a, a, like a, a rough facsimile of... Uh... What about the trope, though, that the creative process itself is destructive to the creator? That being unstable or unhealthy? Uh, well, I always feel like there's... Um, it always leads to something else, you know, just, it's like, yeah, you, know, you follow like, you know, like one creative direction and then you're like, you're there, but you know, the path never ends. You know, you just kind of keep on going. Yeah. You hit a wall, just go in the other direction, move, you know. Or either that or each like, you know, like uh, creative, you know, revelation is a discovery leading to something else, you know? So it's like, oh, wow, awesome. Yeah, but then it's, oh, like then you kind of look past it and you like keep going. Yeah, so it's the twists and turns of uh, of time, you know, to be very poetic about it, I suppose. But um, yeah, we we always have to react and find the, the path, and the you know the journey itself is uh, where the truth. Uh, reveals itself that our strategies often are really just you know, the, the, the art, ha the, the life happens when our strategy in, in encounters these uh, um, barriers and we have to adjust. Mm -hmm. And that's where, where we really, that's where we, the, those, that's where we truly experience life. I think there's a normative way of looking at, what it means to be an artist, which is that in, that, that, that we make art as uh, as a means of self expression, yeah. And there's a much more interesting way of thinking about life as an artist that I learned about a long time ago, and I think has really been a been an important guide, which is the idea that being an artist is it, that art is an act of self creation, not self expression. Uh, and if you feel like you have this one important core thing inside and you've just got to get that out and say that, then, then that can drive you mad. You know, all of the setbacks along the way, uh, external and internal. But if you view, uh, James said something kind of similar, you know, if you view this as an infinite process where, where the point isn't to say the thing that you were trying to say and then you've done it, but... Right. You've finding out, yeah, yeah <laughs> finding out in some ways making this album we find we come to it with ideas about what we think we might be doing and some compositions but 
we find out who we are in the act of of playing together, performing together. So uh, this idea of self-creation through art, and it doesn't mean that you created yourself when you played and then now that's the thing you are. You're always, you're always self-creating. Every time you, you are art making, you're self-creating. Well, um, gentlemen, this has been uh, fantastic uh, talking to you today. Uh, thanks again for uh, making time to talk with me uh, about the album. Uh, before I let you go, where can we go to find out more about Lost Gain, uh, about the release? Um, and where can people go to listen to some of this, uh, hear some of this uh, project? You can go to hear us uh, perform live where there's a dual album uh, release live stream event on Friday. We're celebrating the release of Loss and Gain. And another artist on Infrequent Seams, uh, Eli Wallace, is celebrating the release of his new quartet album. And there are a lot of other uh, wonderful artists that will be performing as well. And um, uh, and the album is available uh, on Bandcamp. It's uh, um, if you uh, uh, you can simply Google for Infrequent Seams, and you'll find the labels. Uh, site um, where all of our uh, um, it's mostly on Bandcamp what we have there right now um, and uh, our album is available on CD and cassette and uh, uh, high definition streamed audio I believe it's also available wherever you find your music as they used to say wherever <laughs> albums are sold um, it, I mean you can find it on all of the streaming services but if yeah. you uh, are so inclined to support artists than buying it directly from the Bandcamp page yeah, uh, from from the label is always the nicest way to do it. But you can also hear it in many places online. And I believe that when you look it up uh, in streaming services, it's under all three of our names individually. So it should be easy to find if you Great. search for James Ilkin Fritz, Brian Chase or Robbie Lee. Thanks to James, Brian, and Robbie for sharing their time and music with me on the process. As always, if you enjoyed this episode, check out other episodes in the series. And as always, like, subscribe, or leave a comment on your preferred podcasting app. I'm Dr. Doug Bielmeyer, and this has been The Process.